CompTIA A Plus Core 1, 220-1101, Practice PBQs. This video is part of our PBQ video series and is filled with information that will help you tackle some of CompTIA's challenging performance-based questions. In this particular video, we will be discussing Wi-Fi SEP. Before we jump all the way into this topic, let's briefly talk about the access point, or AEP. An access point, also called a wireless access point, is a network device that allows wireless communications between devices in a network. It connects Wi-Fi-enabled devices, such as laptops or smartphones, to the network. Access points are used to provide wireless connectivity in homes, offices, and public spaces, enabling mobility and flexibility in network access. It may be easier to think of a network access point as a wireless version of a switch. It acts as a bridge between devices and the network, creating a wireless connection for them to communicate with each other. But what exactly is involved in configuring these devices? Well, there are quite a few configuration settings, but we will stick to the basics and keep this video A plus appropriate. First up, we have the wireless network name. A wireless network name, commonly referred to as the SSID or Service Set Identifier, is essentially the name assigned to a wireless local area network. This is what you see when you search for available Wi-Fi networks on a device. When you set up a wireless access point, you usually get the chance to choose the SSID. It can be anything you like, but it's often something recognizable or meaningful to you. The SSID helps devices like smartphones, laptops, and tablets identify and connect to the correct wireless network. Without it, devices wouldn't know which network to connect to. Next, we have the option to allow communication or not. The wireless radio of the access point can be enabled or disabled in its entirety. If enabled, wireless devices will be able to connect with the access point. Otherwise, wireless devices will not be able to connect. If wireless transmissions are enabled, we also have a setting to control whether or not we will broadcast the SSID. This setting, known as the SSID broadcast setting, determines whether the wireless network name will be openly advertised to nearby devices or kept hidden from view. When SSID broadcast is enabled, the router continuously sends out a signal containing the SSID, much like a beacon, allowing devices to easily detect and connect to the network. This convenience comes with a trade-off in security, as the network becomes readily visible to potential attackers. On the other hand, when SSID broadcast is disabled, the router stops broadcasting the SSID. While this may add a layer of security through obscurity, a skilled attacker can still discover the hidden SSID through various means. Ultimately, whether to enable or disable SSID broadcast depends on the specific security requirements and preferences of the network administrator. It is worth noting that disabling SSID broadcast may inconvenience legitimate users who rely on the SSID to easily discover and connect to the network. Continuing on, we have the mode set. This setting, in the context of wireless networking, determines how a wireless access point will interact with wireless devices. It specifies the wireless standards and protocols that the device will support influencing factors such as data transfer speed, range, and compatibility. The mode setting is important for optimizing the performance and compatibility of a wireless network based on the devices it needs to support and the desired level of performance. Selecting the appropriate mode ensures that devices can connect efficiently and take advantage of the available wireless capabilities. Now we move on to channel selection. Here we need to choose a specific radio frequency within the available frequency spectrum for transmitting and receiving data. Each channel operates within a specific frequency range and is used to avoid interference with other nearby wireless networks. In the United States, for 2.4 GHz Wi-Fi networks, there are 11 channels available for use, 
labeled as channels 1 through 11. These channels have a frequency range from 2.412 GHz to 2.462 GHz. However, it's important to note that in practice, only channels 1, 6, and 11 are considered non-overlapping channels, meaning they don't interfere with each other when used simultaneously. The reason for this non-overlapping pattern is due to the frequency ranges assigned to each channel. Channels 1, 6, and 11 have enough separation between their frequency ranges to minimize interference, even when multiple networks are operating nearby. By strategically selecting these non-overlapping channels, network administrators can optimize the performance and reliability of their Wi-Fi networks, especially in areas with high wireless activity. Avoiding overlapping channels is crucial for minimizing interference and maximizing network performance. When adjacent channels overlap, they can cause signal degradation and decrease data throughput leading to slower and less reliable connections for devices within the affected range. Therefore, it's recommended to configure wireless access points to operate on non-overlapping channels, such as channels 1, 6, and 11, whenever possible. Additionally, in environments with multiple nearby wireless networks, it's important for network administrators to survey the Wi-Fi spectrum and select channels that have the least amount of interference from neighboring networks. This proactive approach can help mitigate performance issues caused by channel congestion and ensure optimal wireless connectivity for users. Using the image behind me, we see three existing networks using the channels 1, 3, and 6 respectively. What channel do you think we should select for our wireless network? I hope you said channel 11. In this scenario, choosing channel 11 prevents any overlap with neighboring networks that are operating on channels 1, 3, and 6. After setting up your wireless network, it is time to focus on securing it against potential threats. This is where the security mode comes in. Firstly, we can choose to completely disable wireless security, sometimes referred to as open authentication. This is not recommended in most cases, as it leaves your network vulnerable to unauthorized access and data interception. It's like leaving your front door unlocked, allowing anyone to enter your home without restriction. While this option offers easy connection due to no password requirement, it comes at the cost of compromising network security. Next, we have the option to enable WEP, or Wired Equivalent Privacy Encryption. WEP employs the RC4 algorithm for encryption and decryption of data packets. While WEP was once commonly used, it's now considered insecure due to its susceptibility to attacks. Think of it as using a flimsy lock on your front door. It might offer some protection, but it's easy for someone with malicious intent to bypass. Enabling WEP might provide basic security, but it's not recommended for modern networks due to its vulnerabilities. Moving on, we have WPA, or Wi-Fi Protected Access. Enabling WPA significantly enhances security compared to WEP by offering stronger encryption and authentication mechanisms. WPA uses TKIP, Temporal Key Integrity Protocol, for encryption. You can think of WPA as upgrading from a flimsy lock to a sturdy deadbolt on your front door. Moving further up the ladder of security, we come to WPA2, or Wi-Fi Protected Access 2. Enabling WPA2 builds upon the foundation of WPA by employing AES, Advanced Encryption Standard, as its encryption algorithm. This provides even stronger protection for your wireless network compared to WPA. Using WPA2 is like upgrading from a sturdy deadbolt to a sophisticated security system with motion sensors and surveillance cameras. Finally, we have the option to enable WPA3, or Wi-Fi Protected Access 3 encryption. Here we introduce the SADs, or Simultaneous Authentication of Equals protocol. This provides enhanced protection against various security threats, including brute force attacks and password guessing, 
making it significantly more resilient than its predecessors. However, it's important to note that not every device supports WPA3 yet. Nonetheless, when available, WPA3 is a great choice for ensuring the highest level of security for your wireless network. Ultimately, the selection of the appropriate security mode depends on your specific security requirements. Factors affecting your selection will most likely include device compatibility, desired level of security, and ease of network connectivity. Depending on the security mode you select, you will then be presented with a few additional setup options. For example, say we select WPA2 as our security mode. You will then be prompted to enter a wireless password. A wireless password, often referred to as a pre-shared key, is the code that is handed out to grant access to your personal wireless network. This wireless password helps protect the network from unauthorized access and ensures that only those with the correct password can utilize it. Now that we understand the basics of the security mode setting, let's move on to network filtering by MAC address. This is an additional layer of security available on most access points. Network filtering allows you to control which devices can access your wireless network. Here we will be establishing access controls based on the MAC address of a connecting device's network interface. When you enable network filtering, there are two main approaches, a deny list and an allow list. With deny list filtering, also known as blacklist filtering, you specify a list of devices that are denied access to the network. All other devices are allowed to connect unless they are on the deny list. This method is useful for blocking known, unauthorized devices or devices exhibiting suspicious behavior. On the other hand, allow list filtering or whitelist filtering works by specifying a list of approved devices that are allowed to connect to the network. Any device not on the list will be denied access. This approach is beneficial for environments where only specific devices should have access, as it ensures that only authorized devices can connect. By configuring network filtering settings using either deny list or allow list approaches, you can restrict access to authorized devices only. Adding another barrier against unauthorized access and enhancing your network security. Using the image behind me, we first see an option to enable or disable MAC filtering in its entirety. Then we get to select the filtering rules. This starts with determining if our list will be a deny list or an allow list. Here, I have selected a deny list. Next, I have added a single MAC address to the list. This MAC address corresponds to the hardware address of device 3 on the right. So what exactly is happening with this setup? Well, with this setup, device 3, and only device 3, will be denied access to our wireless network. As one last security measure, we should change out the default or existing administrative password on the wireless network device. This password serves as the device's login credentials and is used to limit access to the device's configuration interface. Now don't confuse this with the wireless network password or shared key that allows users to connect to the network. This password is used solely for administrative access. And with that last bit of knowledge grasped, you should now be ready to handle any PBQs about Wi-Fi setup. Thank you for watching. Subscribe for more great content.